Good morning. It's uh, beginning to look a lot like Christmas around here. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to our church. My name is Pastor Paul. We are delighted to have you with us online or here in person or downstairs. Uh, if you haven't picked up on all the decorations around here, uh, Nancy Hatfield has been working hard on all that. Uh, all week long she was here working on that, so please give her a thank you for all her hard work and diligence on that. Um, yeah, she did great. Uh, and, and I found out from her, maybe somebody else had told me this before too, but I found out that those ornaments on that little tree over there uh, are handmade by Janet Slemson. All of those, all unique. And that's awesome. Like, before I was just like, oh, there's another tree with some ornaments on it. Now it's like, oh, that's awesome. So that's cool. But it's just a reminder, too, uh, you know, we're glad, we're delighted that we're able to assemble here uh, together to encourage one another. But there's lots of people in our church family that, that aren't able to or don't feel comfortable doing that. And so uh, just a reminder, too, of, hey, you know, give People like Janet or Chuck Tuttle or, or some of these other people we haven't seen in a while, give them a call, send them a card, uh, just let them know that we haven't uh, forgotten about them. And uh, just a great way to minister to our entire church family in that way. Just some other announcements of things coming up. Uh, we have uh, our Awana Christmas store coming up. They're still needing donations for that. That's a, a week from um, Wednesday that that's happening. So uh, they still need donations. If you can help with wrapping, that's also needed. We're also uh, having a congregational meeting today uh, at uh, after Sunday school. At we're trying, we're going to try, we're going to try to have it at eleven forty sharp, sharp, sharp. Because we we have people online that we're going to be coming in on Zoom. We have people that need to get. To other places, we want to have a meeting before people get hangry and all that, right? So, uh, parents, if you could help us out, if you have kids in the Sunday school wing, if you could promptly, after Sunday school ends, or or 11.30, whichever comes first, <laughs> if you could go and get your kids so that you can free up those teachers to be able to come and join the meeting, and teachers, if you can even let out a little early to, to help with that, that would be wonderful. That'll be up here in the sanctuary. We're going to be voting on... Uh, our elder nominees and uh, the budget, both the general and the missionary budget. Last week we heard from uh, Tom Case, uh, who gave a testimony. This week we're going to hear from Matt Carlson. We're going to do it a little differently this morning, though. We have a video testimony, and I'm going to tell you why I asked Matt if he'd be willing to be a guinea pig and do that for us this morning. Uh, but first, I want you to hear from him. I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, even when I when I was really young, I uh, prayed or prayed the, the sinner's prayer as a young child. Uh, but there was really no change in my life at all. Um, I moved away from God. I had no desire for His Word or even Him at all. And as I uh, got into my teen years, I dove deeper into sin. Um, I would attend church on Sundays, but I would live the way I wanted to during the week. Uh, it was really. Uh, no change that uh, you're, the Bible says you're supposed to have in your life um, when you become a true Christian. Uh, when I was a little bit older, I was listening to a message late at night about asking if you're a true Christian. And the Holy Spirit started working on me right there because I was convicted that I was a false convert. Um, I did not see my sin for what it truly was. Uh, I thought that um, just by what I had done in praying the prayer that I was a Christian, but I, uh, the realization that uh, the Holy Spirit gave me was this, that I wasn't, and that I needed to repent and put my trust in Christ, and that I was totally depraved without Christ, or we are totally depraved, and without Christ I had no hope at all for salvation. Uh, slowly, the Holy Spirit began to work in my life and change me. Uh, I admit there's many areas that I fought Him, and I sometimes still do, uh, I want to hang on to the uh, the sins of the flesh that he brings up through the reading and studying of the word, but he does win in the end, that's for sure. Um, now I love the Lord. Uh, I desire his word and I desire him. Um, I have been given the great responsibility of being a spiritual leader for my family. Uh, I know that I will be held accountable for that and uh, my desire is to see my wife Dawn grow in her walk with the Lord and 
for my children to see their true need uh, for salvation at a young age. Um, I know that I can trust the promise that God gives that if we raise our children up in the way that uh, they should go, that when they're older they will not depart. While I know that's not a guarantee our children will all be saved, it is a blessing that the Lord does give us for the diligence, and I work very hard not to miss an opportunity to share Christ with them, read the Bible with them, pray with them. Um, the Lord has changed many areas in my life that used to be absolutely rotten to the core, um, and He's replaced a lot of my desires with the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, he's done this through submission uh, to the preaching, teaching, and reading of His Word, and I see how important it is to read the Bible every single day because without it, this Christian walk it is not possible. Uh, our chief end is to glorify God, and without um, God there, uh, being the one that changed me, uh, there would have been no hope for this wretched sinner. So thank you, Matt, for, for being willing to do that. Uh, I asked him to, if he'd be willing to do it in that format, in that way, because uh, we have a tremendous opportunity coming up uh, in just a couple months. In February, it's our 50th anniversary as a church in the EFCA. And so we have a tremendous opportunity to give thanks, to reflect, to um, praise God for his faithfulness uh, through the years. And uh, one of the ideas uh, that we've had uh, for that is to have different testimonies um, that we can put on a video that we can share with the congregation of, okay, how has God been faithful? Uh, how have you seen God at work through the years? Um, when did you first come to OCC and why did you stay? Uh, these are questions that I would love for us to share our testimonies about and, and be able to even weave them together of a lot of different people answering that same question in our church. And uh, I mean, it's so easy for us to complain. It's so easy for us to grumble about how things aren't the way they, we want them to be in this world. But man, what a tremendous opportunity we have to give thanks and praise God for his faithfulness through the years coming up. That's just my idea for something we can do to celebrate uh, this 50th 50th anniversary coming up. If you have other ideas, we would love to hear them uh, for how we can celebrate that. Uh, but if you would uh, be willing to be a part of uh, recording one of those testimonies, uh, just let me know. We, we are already set up in my office. We're ready to go. If you want to come in sometime during the week or even after, uh, after church on a Sunday, that's set up and ready to go. Uh, we'll have more information coming on that. But uh, just a tremendous opportunity for us to, to give praise to God for his goodness through the years. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for your grace. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to us through the years. We thank you so much for how you have given your son to be our savior. Your son to be one of us. Your son to be born among us. Your son to die and be raised in power for our salvation. We thank you and we praise you for that. And Lord, we pray that you attune our hearts to yours this morning as we lift up your name and praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Osco. Let's stand as we worship together. Emmanuel.
In Revelation chapter 5, we read, I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. And I cried and cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, Stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he, had, when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We are here today because he is worthy. We are here celebrating Christmas because he came. Because he came not just as a little baby boy in a Hallmark card, but he came as a savior who would die for our sins. As a champion who would rise in victory over death. And because of that, we can celebrate. Because of that, we come to the communion table to remind ourselves that he is worthy, that he has done all this for us, that all we have to do is admit that we are wretched sinners, that we are people who have done things, who have thought things, who have said things that are wrong, and we can turn to God and his solution in Jesus. And find the salvation that we all long and ache for, even if we don't know it yet. Oh, praise God. We come this morning remembering that he is worthy. Remembering that he died, that he rose again. And we invite everybody who has made that step of faith. Who has taken that step to decide that, yes, he will be my Savior. He will be my Lord. We invite you to come to join with us. In this time of communion, uh, in just a second, I'm going to invite you up uh, with a number of people. I encourage just one representative from each family to, to come up and to uh, get one of our all-in-one cups. Uh, and then we will have a time of quiet where we can pause, where we can reflect on the reality, where we can praise God that he is worthy. Where we can examine our own hearts to see, in what ways have I exalted myself in thinking that I am worthy? In what ways have I put myself above Christ? In what ways am I putting myself above others? And so I encourage you to take advantage of that time to do that. So let me pray and then I'll pull that back and you can come on up. Father God, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you that he is worthy. We thank you that he is our sacrifice. That he is our savior. And Lord we pray that you would bless and remind us. Of the precious reality of who you are. And all we have in you. Amen.
haven't already removed the film from the top of your cup there, I do that now. The Apostle Paul writes for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, What I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please join me in prayer once again. Holy Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence. And it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we've earned it or have maintained it. But it's all and only because of the great love with which you loved us. It's all and only because you have given us your Son. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning. You would break us free from being turned in on self. You would break us free from the patterns of destruction and strife that this world has taught us. I pray that you would help us to once again see, to behold, in holy wonder, your great plan. Lord, if there are any here that do not know you who have not received you, but they would today. If there are any here that have wandered, that they would come home to you today. And if there are any here who think they don't need this message, that you would remind them, remind all of us that we do. Thank you for your word. In your wonderful plan. In your name we pray. Amen. It's amazing the amount of planning and work and expertise that go into producing things that we regularly take for granted. Uh, we travel to the big city. We see a skyscraper towering above everything else. And we say, well, that, that, that's tall. But how often do we pause to think about how many men and women work to build that using all sorts of machines and tools? How much, many hours went into that? How much energy and effort and materials to build that building that towers over the city and that doesn't just fall over randomly? Or we take a trip and fly in a plane and we might think, well, I'm glad this hunk of metal actually stays up here and, and flies. But how often do we pause to think of the, the precision that the aircraft manufacturers have to use as they build these planes? There's no, well, you know, that's good enough. You know, good enough means it won't take off or it'll fall out of the sky. 
We don't think even about the countless hours and days and failed attempt after failed attempt after failed attempt until those Wright brothers finally figured out that it took just to figure out how to fly and get up there, how to not fall like a rock out of the sky. Or, or we think of even the ships uh, made for the Navy. We, we look at them and we say, well, there, there, there's, there's a ship, there's a boat, there's a vessel. How often do we think about how much planning and work went into that to make sure it can withstand wind and storm and sea, to make sure it can carry all that it needs to carry, to make sure it can still operate in waters that are only so deep. Their plans, the, the specifications have to be just right. It's amazing the amount of planning and work and expertise that go into producing things we regularly take for granted. We see it and we think, well, that's a tall building, that's a plane, that's a ship. Instead of stepping back and saying, wow. And I think the same thing can happen when it comes to God's plan of salvation. We stand at the end of the stream. We have the complete revealed word of God, Old and New Testaments. Christ has already come and fulfilled so much of what was prophesied. Our redemption is already a done deal. He died on the cross, was raised from the dead. But how often do we pause and give thanks for the wonderful, the beautiful, the amazing plan of God through the ages and centuries and generations that went into us being able to receive this salvation. That went into sovereignly, flawlessly guiding all these things according to his perfect plan of wisdom and love. And so this morning I like to do that, to look back, even all the way back to the beginning and see and appreciate and rejoice in these things. We are in the, the midst of our Advent Sermon Series. I've entitled uh, Splinters of Great News. We are using this unique um, nativity set uh, and its different pieces uh, to talk about uh, different parts, different aspects, different splinters of the good news that Jesus has come. And so last week we looked at the baby piece and use it as a springboard to talk about the virgin birth, why it matters, what difference it should make in our life. Um, and this week, we're going to take that bigger piece, that on its side, you know, it's where the baby, it's the setting for the baby, but flip it up, and it's, of course, the cross. Uh, turn it right side up, and there you have the cross. But more than just talking about the cross, I want to talk about this little notch down here and what it reminds me of, and I hope what it will remind you of uh, when, when, when we talk about it. It reminds me of the, the first announcement of Christmas. If somebody were to ask you, when was Christmas first announced? What would you say? Maybe you'd think of the angels announcing it to the shepherds in the field or the, the star in the sky that the wise men followed. Uh, maybe you'd think, well, no... The angel came to Mary before all of that and announced what was going to happen. But maybe then you think, well, you know, there's prophecies. Isaiah spoke of a virgin birth. The child uh, would be born. A son would be given who would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But even before all of that, I believe the first announcement of Christmas, really of the gospel, is found back in Genesis. Even at the almost beginning of it. As we're going to see this morning, even from the very start of our sin, God had a plan to win us back. I invite you to turn with me to the beginning of your Bibles, to Genesis 3. We're going to be zeroing in specifically on Genesis 3, verse 15, which is known as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, the first hint of all that was to come in the unfolding drama of redemption, the very first gospel sermon that was ever preached on earth. And even though they did not and could not have fully understood what these words would one day mean, this is the first, the only promise of hope that Adam and Eve and their children and many generations' children after them had to cling to for a very, very long time. Here in Genesis 3, even with the fall and judgment and curses, is the first seed of hope that would eventually lead us all the way to Christ. Everything else in the Bible flows from these words. As an acorn has the mighty oak in it, so these words contain the whole plan of salvation, the first announcement of Christmas that was coming. The great English 
preacher Charles Simeon called this verse the sum and summary of the whole Bible. Again, as we'll see, even from the very start of our sin, God had a plan to win us back. But before we get to verse 15, what is the context here? What led up to this moment and this verse? Obviously, this takes place near the beginning of human history, of all of history in planet Earth, of the universe. Genesis 1, God creates everything, and everything is good. See that over and over again. Genesis 2, God goes into more detail about how he created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, in his image, and put them in his paradise, in Eden. And again, everything up to this point, great. But in chapter 3, everything goes bad, very bad, fatally, inescapably, horribly bad. Every human being who will ever walk on this earth is affected by what happens in this third chapter. And it explains why things are the way they are in this world. Why there is so much evil and sin and corruption. Why there is disease and deformity and death. Why there is conflict and hatred and war and disasters of all kinds. Genesis 3. It all goes back to there. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world in a state of innocence, free from sin, until they did the one thing that God told them not to do. Until they fell to the temptation of Satan, a temptation to, that, that, that called in the question, the integrity of God and the righteousness and goodness and wisdom of God. They became doubters of God and they fell and with them the entire race fell. Adam and Eve, by their sin, set in motion a spiritual avalanche that carries the whole human race down and buries all of us in death. As Paul put it, as in Adam, all died. Deceived by the serpent, they ate the forbidden fruit and entered into a state of paradise that now had sin in it. And it was no longer paradise. And afterward, their first impulse was to hide from God. Second was to make excuses for their sins, blame others. All this should sound familiar because we all do that too. Adam blames the woman. Eve blames the serpent. No one takes responsibility. Everyone is the victim. And suddenly paradise isn't so beautiful. It's all been ruined, marred by sin. In that moment, there is only one that is happy. Satan, embodied in the snake, really it's his finest moment. He delights in what is happening because this is exactly what he wanted. He intended to humiliate God by ruining paradise. He wrecked God's plan and gained the whole world for himself. He has shown the whole universe that God's great experiment would not work. That no race of beings could ever be trusted to freely obey God. Left to themselves, they will always disobey, even in paradise. And in Genesis 3, 14 through 19, God issues judgments and curses on the serpent and the woman and the man. They each stand as representatives, heads of their race. What the woman was once to do as a blessing, that is, have children, be a marriage partner, has now been tainted by the curse. In those moments of life's greatest blessing of children, of marriage, the woman would now sense most clearly the pain, the fallout, the consequences of her rebellion against God. What the man was once to do as a blessing, to rule over the earth, is now also reversed. As the ground, instead of submitting to him, will resist him, will eventually swallow him. Work itself is a blessing, but now it would be a curse, a labor. The man will also suffer pain and frustration in his relationships. But before God gets to all that, he begins with something else. He begins where sin started, with the serpent. And here, in a lot of ways, the most unexpected of places, in the midst of judgment and curses, in words not even spoken to the man or to the woman, but directed toward the serpent, here we find grace. Here we find gospel. Here is the first hint, the first announcement of Christmas. Let me read first just verse 14 to set us up for 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. 
You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Satan might have thought that he had won. But as Spurgeon says, but now God comes in, takes up the quarrel personally, and causes him to be disgraced on the very battlefield upon which he had gained a temporary success. Now, some people like to talk here about how they think snakes before this might have been walking around on legs or upright or had wings or, I don't know, maybe was standing up like the, the gecko on the Geico commercials talking, you know, I don't know, cute and cuddly and whatever. I don't know what it was like before that. Uh, but there is a sense with this curse, whatever was attractive about the snake before, that's been changed. And even if he had always slithered on the ground, it is now infused with a new meaning, a new significance. Because he specifically, of all the cattle representing the domesticated animals, and of all the wild animals, he specifically would be cursed in a very specific way. This animal would be a permanent symbol, a constant reminder of the disgrace and defeat of Satan. This fallen angel who had been so great and glorious has been so brought down low that he is slithering on the ground and symbolically eating dirt. Anybody ever ate dirt? Back when they were a kid? Probably have photos of some of our kids eating dirt or sand at the beach or whatever else. But licking dust in the Old Testament was an expression of, of total defeat. Uh, and so every slithering, uh, dust-eating snake is a symbol of the crushing curse of God and the judgment that has come on Satan. Snakes are a constant reminder to everyone that Satan is a defeated enemy. And this is a curse, by the way, that will never be removed. Isaiah 65 we get a glimpse at the millennial kingdom, a future time when Christ establishes his kingdom on earth. And what do we read in Isaiah 65, 25? The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. <laughs> Even then, forever then, dust will still be the serpent's food. They will never get out of it. It will be a permanent symbol of the disgrace and defeat of Satan. But God's curse on Satan doesn't stop there. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. There's two predictions here. First one, there will be a conflict for the ages. The serpent, Satan, may have thought that in his campaign against God that he had won. He might have thought that when he won the confidence of Adam and Eve, when he turned them against God, caused them to d distrust God and his word, he thought he, he thought he won. He had overthrown God. That he had finally achieved what he had wanted to achieve and that he was now sovereign. But had he? Had he destroyed God's plan and his purposes? Nope. God is still God, still in charge. And as God says that he himself and I myself We'll put enmity, a word that speaks of, of deep animosity, of conflict. God says, I will set, not, not just a friendly game show family feud, a blood feud. A war between Satan and humanity. And Satan thought, maybe, that, hey, I've turned Adam and Eve, the human race against God. I've won this deal. I've captured them all. I've got the mom and dad of everybody else that's going to come. They've chosen to worship me, to be their friend, to love and to trust me. I've won. And God says, no, 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 not so fast. I'm going to turn the human race against you. If Satan thought by deceiving her, he had her in his back pocket. He was wrong. And not just because snakes don't have back pockets. If he thought that he had won the entire human race, he was wrong. God said, there will come enmity from humanity towards you. You do not rule. You will not exercise complete control. You will not have the whole human race. Eve will turn on you. She will hate you. There will be hostility because she will turn to me. And from her will come a redeemed humanity. 
God will enable man in his fallen, sinful state to be so totally transformed so that he will hate the serpent and love God. This mess would be reversed. Adam and Eve chose to love Satan and, and hate God. They chose to doubt God and believe Satan. But that would not be the final word. A change would come, and, and we'll get to how in just a minute. But this conflict would not just be between the woman Eve and the serpent. No, it would go far beyond her. This conflict would extend for generations. It would be between your offspring and hers. Generations yet on board would trace their heritage back to Eve, the, the mother of all the living. That seed or offspring of her refers to the men and women of faith of every generation who believed in God. Out of her would come a race of redeemed humanity that would be at war, at enmity with Satan. And would also believe and trust and love God and hate Satan. You can see them. You can trace that godly line through the Bible. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Ruth, David, Daniel, Esther, so many others all the way up to Jesus. Satan would have his own seed, his own offering, offspring of those that would follow him. Throughout history and every generation, every country and every city, every village, every tribe, every clan, Satan has had his people. You can trace that line through Cain who killed Abel, to the wicked generation in Noah's day, to the Pharaoh who opposed Moses, the wicked Canaanites in the land, people like Goliath who laughed at David and David's God, people who hated the prophets and murdered them in cold blood. Fast forward to Jesus' day, when he was born, Herod tried to kill him. When he grew up, the Pharisees opposed him and plotted to take his life. Satan even infiltrated his inner circle, filling Judas' heart with evil. When he was arrested, men stood in line to lie about him. When Pilate offered release, the bloodthirsty crowd cried for Barabbas instead. Matthew Henry puts it so well when he wrote... It was the devil that put it into the heart of Judas to betray Christ, of Peter to deny him, of the chief priests to prosecute him, of the false witnesses to accuse him, and of Pilate to condemn him, aiming in all of this by destroying the Savior to ruin the salvation. The conflict of the ages, the struggle between those who believe in God and those who don't began in Genesis 3.15. There's now a fundamental division in the human race. As Francis Schaeffer put it, from this time on in the flow of history, there are two humanities. The one humanity says there is no God, or it makes God in its own image, or it tries to come to God in its own way. The other humanity comes to the true God in God's way. There is no neutral ground. And the natural question we should all ponder is, well, which of these am I? Which humanity do I belong to? Whose seed am I? This conflict has continued through the centuries, continues even today, but this is a conflict that would be decided once for all in a climactic, epic showdown. And we see that in prediction number two, of wounded yet victorious. Again, Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. There would be a redeemed humanity who would be hostile to Satan, but there would be one man, a he, who would come from woman, who would be Satan's destroyer. And so birth pangs... Uh, wouldn't just be a reminder of the fall and the curse. It would also be a sign of impending joy, of hope that this he promised by God would be born and would one day defeat Satan. But not without cost, not without being wounded himself. And we're talking, of course, about Jesus. Notice there are two wounds in this conflict, but it makes all the difference in the world where they are located. Satan would strike his heel. If you've ever had problems with your heel or foot or ankle or Achilles tendon, you know how painful it can be. It can slow you down, make you go on crutches, 
Make you have to take painkillers, have surgery, but it doesn't kill you. It's just a flesh wound. You can live with heel problems even though you have to hobble around. If you were to ask your doctor which is more serious, a head injury or a foot injury, they would quickly tell you a foot injury is not more serious than a head injury. And Satan certainly did strike and bruise and beat Christ. He is our wounded and suffering Savior. When Christ died on the cross, Satan struck his heel. Satan delivered a terrible blow to Jesus on Good Friday. When Jesus yielded up his spirit, darkness came over the land. It seemed that Satan had won, no doubt. He thought he had thrown the knockout punch, but he was wrong. All he did was strike Jesus on the heel. I love how Spurgeon put it. Look at your master and your king upon the cross. All disdained with blood and dust. There was his heel most cruelly bruised. When they take down that precious body and wrap it in fair white linen and in spices and lay it in Joseph's tomb, they weep as they handle the casket in which the deity had dwelt. For there again Satan had bruised his heel. The devil had let loose Herod and Pilate and Caiaphas and the Jews and the Romans. That is all, however. It is only his heel and not his head that is bruised. For lo, the champion rises again. Oh, preach it, Brother Chuck. Yes. Satan gave Christ all he had and wounded him severely. But as painful as it was, that suffering was nothing compared to what Christ did to Satan. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. When Jesus died on the cross, he delivered a crushing blow to Satan. Heel wounds are painful, but they don't kill you. Nobody survives a crushed head. <laughs> the cross was God's death blow to Satan. When Jesus died and rose from the dead, he utterly defeated Satan. Colossians 2.15, Christ, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He crushed the serpent's head once and for all. And so that picture of a man with a great boot heel stomping on the head of a snake to crush its skull is a picture of the total defeat of Satan accomplished on the cross. And even though he still fights, he still rails against it, Satan's fate is sealed. How did Jesus defeat Satan at the cross? Well, by providing the atonement necessary to pay our debt of sin in, in full. By paying and satisfying the, the justice of God, by conquering death, by opening heaven, by providing the only way that a humanity that rebelled and sinned against God and continues to do so could be restored to a right relationship with him. By providing the only way a broken and sinful humanity could be made whole again and be able to look forward to one day entering paradise with God again. Adam and Eve were barred from paradise. They were kicked out. But Jesus is the way back. The way to reclaim all that was lost. The all-wise, sovereign, loving God fulfilled his eternal purpose of redemption through our Savior, our champion, the promised Savior, the seed of a woman. And he is the ultimate seed of a woman. No other man was involved in his conception. No other seed involved there. Born of a woman. Born a virgin. Even from the very start of our sin, God had a plan to win us back. And so when I look at this nativity set, I'm reminded of the cross. But even more than that, with this notch, this chunk that was taken out of where the feet of our Savior would have been, I'm reminded of this old and precious promise the first hint of the gospel, the first announcement of Christmas, the promise of the struck heel and the crushed head, the promise of costly suffering and sacrifice, but of ultimate victory and triumph. And this notch is a reminder for me that in Christmas, in Jesus' coming, though the pain of that child being born, an echo of the fall, the, the snake would be defeated. 
blessing would be restored. Because at Christmas, that long-awaited champion, our champion, stepped out of heaven to wage war on the serpent. It would mean great suffering and cost. His heel would be struck, but ultimately he would win. He crushed the head of Satan in the cross and resurrection. He received that blow, but he gave an even greater one. Jesus dealt the crushing final war-winning, humanity-redeeming blow to Satan. But so what? What does all this ancient history have to do with me? Well, first, if you haven't trusted in him yet, do it. But two other points of application. First, the Christian life will be a struggle, but we will see victory. I think in our American culture where everything is about me, where it's about achieving the better future for me and mine, where it's about surrounding myself with comfort and entertainment and success and things that make me feel good and things that I want, I think we can forget that those goals for all those things really have very little if nothing to do with real Christianity. As much as we are allergic and run from suffering and pain and discomfort, we need reminders that Christ never promised us a pain-free life. Or that he'll instantly solve all our problems and surround us with this nerf force field of protection as soon as we trust in him. No, quite the opposite. He said the way of following him would be the way of cost, of sacrifice, of being estranged from this world and its ways of being tempted and tried and yet remaining faithful to him through it all. You know, the Christian life is not easy. It's a struggle. Struggle implies sweat and effort and and difficulty. That's why Paul uses images of of running, of laboring, of of fighting. Christian life isn't easy. It's hard work that demands your, your full commitment, full engagement of your everything. We are locked in a struggle until the day we die with temptation, with Satan, with this world, with our own sinful and selfish heart. Sometimes we'll win that battle, sometimes we'll not win that battle. But don't get discouraged because the Christian life isn't easy. It's not supposed to be. We're at war. Life is hard. Times are difficult. The enemy attacks on every side and we won't engage in all this without being wounded in the conflict. If God put his own son through all that he did, how are we going to escape the wounds of life? If Christ suffered in doing God's will, so will we. We will all struggle hard in this life, and in struggling, we'll be wounded. We'll stumble, we'll fall, we'll get discouraged, we'll feel defeated. But friends, don't give up. Don't give in. Because yes, we will struggle, we will be wounded too. But in the end, because of Christ, we will see victory. He secured it on the cross. It's already been done. He's already dealt Satan a death blow. This is a victory we share in, and we will even participate in. Yes, Christ has triumphed over all the powers of evil, trampled them underfoot. But one day, friends, and oh my goodness, this is wonderful. One day, so will we. And if you don't believe me, you can turn to or jot down Romans 16, 20. Romans 16, 20. The peace of God will soon crush Satan under your feet. Same language. And we expect it to say under Christ's feet, don't we? But it doesn't. The peace of God will soon crush Satan under your feet. We get to be a part of doing that. I can't wait to do that. We are not on the losing team. We will have the final victory over Satan. And it's a victory that won't just be something that's distant from us or abstract from us or that we read about and say, oh, that's great. No, we will participate in that triumph. One day the blood, the body of Christ, with Christ as our exalted head, will once again destroy Satan forever and evil forever. We will trample him underfoot. We will get to do that. He will receive his due, his payback for every lie and false promise we fell for, for every temptation that 
destroyed us for every sin that tortured us. Can't wait. So stand and fight. There's no victory without struggle and wounding and pain. Persevere, struggle on until the day of final victory. One more Spurgeon quote. Let us resist the devil always with this belief that he has received a broken head. Let us do this bravely and tell him to his teeth that we are not afraid of him. Tell him to recollect his bruised head, which he tries to cover with a crown of pride. We know him and see the deadly wound he bears. His power is gone. He is fighting a lost battle. He is contending against omnipotence. Therefore, brethren, be steadfast in resisting the evil one, being strong in faith, giving glory to God. Second application point. Rejoice in the grace and love and wisdom and plan of God. Again, even from the very start of our sin, God had a plan to win us back. Don't miss that. Notice where this Great gospel promise of Genesis 3.15. Notice where this first announcement of Christmas is given. The curse and judgment on man and woman have not yet been given. They would in the next few verses. Before God even lays out the price that men and women are going to have to pay. Before God even pronounces judgment on them. Before God even banishes them from paradise. Before he sends them out, forbids them to ever come back. Before anyone has died or felt the effects. Before punishment has been placed on their back. Hope is placed in their hearts. Don't miss that. How great is the compassion and grace and mercy of our loving and forgiving God. Planting hope in the midst of of curse. When my boys disobey, and it happens, they aren't perfect, even if they're pastor's kids, they need to go to their room sometimes. Sometimes it's because they need to cool down. Sometimes it's because I need to cool down. God didn't need time to cool down. God didn't need a few hundred years to think about it. God didn't need to take the time or wait us out. Right from the heels of sin, while the wounds were still fresh, before judgment is even given, words of mercy and grace and comfort are spoken. And even though it would cost his son dearly, even from the very start of our sin, God lovingly set a plan in motion that would redeem us, that would win us back. Aren't you glad that we serve a God like that? Aren't you glad that we serve a God who delights in mercy like that? That even before he pronounces the curse, even before he kicks them out, he gives them and us salvation hope. He promises a Savior who will one day conquer Satan and sin. What an amazing promise. What a gracious God. Let us remember and rejoice in the rich heritage of faith that we are a part of. Let us give thanks that we don't have just one promise of gospel hope to hold on to like Adam and Eve did. We have the the full revelation of God in his word. Genesis 3.15 was the start. We stand at the end with so many more promises to rejoice in. Let us rejoice in the grace and love and wisdom and plan of God that even from the very start of our sin, God had a plan to win us back. And let us press on and persevere in this fight. This great struggle is hard. We will be wounded at times. But because of what Christ has done in the cross and resurrection, victory is assured. The serpent's head is broken. And rejoice in that. Be fueled by that. Strive in all that we say and do to make it known to others. To go and tell it on the mountain. To share it with them. The good news that Jesus is born. The good news of the struck heel and the crushed head. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace that reaches down 
to even us. And I pray that you would give hope in our hearts. That no matter how dark the night seems, no matter how black our sin might feel, that you have paid the debt in full, that you have won the victory over all, and that you love us so much. Help us to rest and rejoice and proclaim the good news of all that. Amen. Stand with us as we close. Stick around for Sunday school starting at 10.30 and our, our annual meeting as well at 11.40 sharp. And now go remembering and rejoicing that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. Three, four, go.